Welcome to Modern Dogma, a Christian considering today's ideas. I'm your host, Elias. One way to describe the insanity of our modern day is people no longer know who they are. And in such an identity vacuum, people adopt all sorts of false or even tragically perverse identities. Marxist ideologies group people into arbitrary oppressor versus oppressed identities according to their job, religion, gender, or socioeconomic status. Men identify themselves as women, and women men. These are some of the more obviously deformed ways of thinking that I think are being well covered by faithful men and women in the church today. But today I want to talk about what I believe is one of the most pervasive false identities that is so resilient because it is so subtle. So subtle, in fact, that I would argue that even many well-meaning Christians buy into this false identity and unwittingly build a large part of their worldview on it. It's an identity that garners a lot of interest, especially every four years leading up to an election, and that's because it's become so embedded into the fabric of who we are that politicians know that it can inflame the worst passions within us when this identity is threatened by some real or fictitious adversary with the hope, of course, of translating itself into political action. I am, of course, talking about race. If you were to ask a typical person on the street the fundamental question, who are you? I would wager that race would be among the top three answers. I'm white, I'm black, I'm Hispanic, I'm Asian. However, we rarely ask ourselves the question, what is race anyway? And is it a legitimate group identity? Immediately, we sense that something is wrong with the concept of race because nobody seems to be able to give a concrete answer. The best we get typically is, eh, it's a tricky topic. The government certainly has no clue. The United States Census Bureau, in trying to define what it means to be racially black, gives this amusingly unhelpful definition, quote, a person having origins in any of the black racial groups of Africa, end quote. Thank you so much. The Census Bureau has come to a brilliant insight that to be black is to be racially black. You don't say. Now, to the Census Bureau's credit, they all but concede they have no clue what to do with race because they go on to state, quote, an individual's response to the race question is based upon self-identification. The racial categories included in the census questionnaire generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country and not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically, end quote. In other words, you decide. It's your opinion. We have no clue. We can't peg race to anything solid. It's a social thing. There's no DNA test we can perform that tells you what your race is. It's just made up according to society's ever-shifting definitions. And that is 100% the truth. It is a fact that race, as it is defined in the present day, is nothing more than our collective, stereotype-driven, subjective interpretations of what you look like. Your nose looks like this. Your brow looks like this. Your eyes are like this. Your skin is this color. So we just ballpark it and say, eh, you're a white guy. Or, eh, you have dark hair and dark skin. You're Hispanic. So if you take the Census Bureau's useless definition of a black person as someone who comes from the black racial groups of Africa, and then you do some digging to try to figure out what exactly the black racial groups of Africa are, To many people, it again just boils down to a subjective interpretation of someone's outer appearance. Now, these stereotypes seem pretty solid. It feels like, come on, I can tell who a black person is. I can tell who's American Indian or white. But the fact is, the immutable truth of these racial categories is illusory. It's an illusion. And I demonstrate it this way. Take skin color. Skin people and sort them by how dark their skin is. Start with a guy that has the darkest skin and go to someone with albinism, the palest. What you will discover is that the human race is a smooth, continuous spectrum of skin color. 
There is no discernible gap in the color spectrum where you can put a sharp boundary and say, okay, at this level of darkness, you have black people. And then at this next level of darkness, you're an American Indian. And then another nice sharp boundary where you say, okay, and this is where the Asian skin color starts to appear. And this is where Asians end. And then you get white people from here on out. Now, you can do this with any feature. We think, oh, I totally know what an Asian person is. Just look at the eyes. But not actually so cut and dried. Take that same group of a million people and just take a photograph of their eyes. Lay it all out. And once again, you will discover that what you believed was this so obviously objective almond-shaped eye that makes an Asian person actually exists again on a smooth, uninterrupted continuum of slightly varying eye shapes across the human population. And the same exact thing for the brow, chin shape, nose shape, face shape, and on and on. You know, I'm having this exact problem with my two-year-old right now who is trying to learn colors. I go, what color is this? And he goes, orange. And I say, no, it's red. Well, Actually, okay, I can see why you think it's orange. Well, it's like a light red, and maybe it's like a dark orange. The boundaries of colors are fuzzy, and it's identical to what we presently call someone's race. It is subjective. By the way, there are outliers to this illusory, rock-solid social construct called race that we as a society have no idea what to do with, and they just float out there in no man's land feeling like they don't belong anywhere. For instance, for some reason, so-called half-Asian people tend to have a physical appearance that society just doesn't have a stereotype for. We don't know what to call these people. I've had multiple half-Asian friends lament to me that they grew up with these identity crises because the white guys don't see me as white, but then the Asian guys don't see me as Asian. What am I? Where do I belong? Jewish people are another example. What is a Jewish person? Is that a race? Is a Jewish guy whose ancestors come from Northern Europe a white person? How about the Jewish guy from Lebanon with really dark hair and skin? What do we call these people? Where do we stereotype these people? And all this speaks to an error known as racialism. You see, race, like colors, is ultimately grounded in people's changing opinion. It's not a rock-solid fact of life. It's grounded in the fact that, since I was a little kid, I saw society around me call a certain group of people black, and that got my brain to start thinking, why are these 10 people all considered black? What is the pattern here? What is the stereotype, in other words? And then after a million times of seeing someone labeled as black by society, I formed this social construction of, oh, okay, whenever I see these particular physical traits, that means black. It becomes associated in my mind. And the same goes for white and Asian, and we can throw Hispanic into the mix here. The Census Bureau doesn't officially recognize Hispanic as a race, if you didn't know, but the Census Bureau is clueless anyway. And since race are just buckets of stereotypes regarding people's appearances, clearly Hispanic is another racial category in our culture today. When we say the word Hispanic man, we have a stereotype in our head of what we think we will see. Hence, Hispanic has become a race. Whether it's right or wrong, that's not the point. I'm just saying that's true for American society today. Now, that all being said, I'm not necessarily saying there is no use for racial language at all. Like colors, because race is subjective doesn't necessarily mean we throw it out entirely. The word stereotype, it just basically means patterns. How we identify colors is by stereotypes in that sense. We've been trained to identify the stereotype that says a certain color is blue. So full disclosure, I use racial language all the time. I call people white, American Indian, Hispanic, black, Asian. But like colors, there needs to be a firm grasp of what race is and what race is not when it is appropriate to use the concept of race, and when the concept of race is utterly irrelevant. Race, like colors, has limited use only as a description. That's it. That's the extent of its usefulness. So, say I'm with my dad at the mall, and I see my friend George in the distance. I say to my dad, oh, hey, that's my friend George. And my dad asks, Who's George? 
when I respond with, oh, you know, the tall white guy in the red shirt. Describing George as white in this sentence was helpful, wasn't it? Because we all, again, as a society, have formed this subjective, stereotypical, yet nonetheless helpful picture of what we expect to see when we use the word white person. So in this non-malicious, innocuous use of racial terminology, I help my dad quickly identify my friend George as distinct from Idris Elba, who is walking next to him. But note that the word white here carries the same significance of describing George's identity as a person as the fact that George is also tall and he is wearing a red shirt. That is to say, none. No significance. You see, as soon as you start injecting in the concept of race anything more than the fact that it is a mere descriptor of what someone looks like on the outside, you have waded into the wrong teaching known as racialism. In other words, racialism is the lie that your race forms your identity, your personhood, your character, who you are, who other people are on the inside. So let's return to the U.S. Census Bureau, and I want you to see how our government's official thinking is just steeped in the error of racialism. You see, the Census Bureau just admitted they have no clue what race is. They admit it. It's arbitrary. It's self-identified. It's a social construct. And yet they state the reason we collect information on your race is because it is, quote, critical in making policy decisions, particularly for civil rights. States use these data to meet legislative redistricting principles. Race data also are used to promote equal employment opportunities and to assess racial disparities in health and environmental risks, end quote. Real world consequences, real policy decisions that affect your and my life is built upon this facade of race as an identity. According to the Census Bureau, our government and I would argue the vast majority of society, and perhaps even many Christians, it means something. It says something about who you are as a person simply because your face looks a certain way. Whether or not you get a job, your so-called civil rights, legislative redistricting, is all determined based on your mere appearance. Nothing you have control over. Nothing you did or didn't do. You were just born into it. And yet real decisions are going to be made on your behalf because you look a certain way. Now, racialism, unlike racism, is not necessarily explicitly malicious. In fact, as I just stated, the vast, vast majority of the world are racialists. And I do not believe most of the world are truly racist, as I understand the term. Racialists can often be people that are vehemently, passionately anti-racist. They can be extremely sensitive and they try to be considerate to the preferences of people that look different from them. They may dedicate their lives, in fact, to fighting against the lack of privileges certain so-called racial groups suffer. Yet, the grand irony is, the zealous anti-racist that nevertheless builds his worldview upon the myth that one's race has something to say about the person perpetuates the false ideological foundation of racialism upon which racism is built. Racism requires racialism to exist. You see, a racist thinks his group of people that look similar are superior to this other group of people that look similar. It's a wicked, proud, self-righteous way of thinking. However, the foundational belief of the racist is that people can be grouped by how they look in the first place. In other words, racialism. So the anti-racist, racialist, white social justice advocate that preaches about how his fellow white people need to recognize their inherent privilege as white people, as well-intentioned as he may be, nevertheless strengthens a false belief that there is such a thing as a white person in the first place. There are people that look white. If that's what you mean by white person, fine. However, a white person as some monolithic identity is a myth. 
It's absurd and frankly harmful. Look, there are people that are tall, but a tall person with a capital T does not exist. There are women with shoulder length hair. The shoulder length hair woman with her distinct shoulder length hair culture and shoulder length hair desires and preferences does not exist. So, that being said, what does the Bible teach about identity? As you know, on this show, everything is about God's Word. That is the whole point of modern dogma. We want to try to view everything through the lens of Scripture as our starting point. We all have starting points, by the way. Might as well use the right one invented by the creator of the universe. The Bible teaches that every human being has basically three identities. We can be categorized three different ways, in other words, and that's it. Every other categorization is invented by men and has limited to no use. And oftentimes, worse than that, man-made identities can be explicitly destructive to who we are and to society. We're going to talk about these identities over the next few episodes and at the end discuss, so what? What are the implications of these three identities? But those three identities, the three categories human beings can be sorted into are, one, your group identity, two, your individual identity, and three, your spiritual identity. And today, we are going to talk about what the Bible considers to be our legitimate group identity, and it is not our so-called race. You see, God was pleased to make diversity at the very beginning of creation. Think about it. God did not have to make a sky that was distinct from the earth. He did not have to make a distinct light that ruled the day from a light that ruled the night. He did not have to make different creatures for the heavens versus the earth versus the waters. And with people, he did not have to make two different genders. And from the first two people, he did not have to have diverse groups of people. Humanity could have just been a bunch of copy and pasted atoms. But God wanted diversity. It was obviously good. He designed it. He wanted distinct people groups. He didn't want the human population to be a flat valley of beige people. He wanted mountain peaks. He wanted categories of people, in other words. But the question is, what are those mountain peaks called? What are those groups of people that have strongly shared similarities called? The world's answer is races. Races of people. They're called black people. They're called white people. They're called Asian people. But to truly answer that question from God's perspective, we turn to one particularly helpful passage, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Now, setting up the context for you, in this passage, God's heavenly servants are praising Jesus because Jesus saved people from all the different group identities among the human population. And what's wonderful about Revelation 5.9 is God defines for us what those group identities are. The verse states, quote, Worthy are you, that is Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, end quote. Did you catch that? You see, once again, God was pleased to make diverse groups of people. We're not all just different from each other at an individual to individual level. We are also different from one another in terms of the different group identities we belong to. Groups of people are different from other groups of people, in other words. And those group identities are defined for us in Revelation 5.9 as one, tribes, two, peoples, three, languages, and four nations. Now, I rearranged the order there, and you'll see why in a second. But notice in this verse that race is not one of those group identities. In fact, you will never find race mentioned anywhere in Scripture, not because God didn't know we would invent the concept of racialism hundreds of years later. It's because the Bible denies racialism's validity. It's not a real thing. Now, let's look at each of these four group identities in turn, and I'm going to suggest some alternative labels for a couple of them that I think better fits our contemporary language. 
So the first category, tribe, in the original Greek, which is what Revelation was originally written in, is phileis, which refers to a group of people of the same familial descent. They are related by blood to one another. So this is pretty close to what we would call our extended family or clan. So think the Johnson family, the Rockefeller family, or in the Bible, the family of Abraham. That's your phileis, your tribe, your family. That is the first category of diversity we belong to when it comes to our group identity. So if you take the Johnson family and the Paulson family, even if both families have pale skin, blonde hair, they're both descriptively white people. How many of us recognize the fact that there is a very important group distinction between the Johnsons and Paulsons simply owing to the fact that they belong to two different families, two different phileis? Because apparently, according to the word of God, that distinction is very real and needs to be accounted for. You can't just oversimplify them and just say immediately, oh, they're just all a bunch of white people, right? and think, oh, they have their own white people culture. They're all the same. Apparently, the Bible does not agree with that kind of sentiment. The second category that defines our group identity is people, or lau in the Greek. And this is really just a larger version of your family. So take a bunch of humans that can trace back to some common ancestor, scale it way up to a huge size, and you go from tribe to people, phileis, to Lau. So taking a biblical example again, the tribe of Judah, the family of Judah, if you blow it up to a large scale, becomes the people of Israel. The O'Reilly tribe or family become the Irish people. You see? This second category, I would argue, is very similar to what we presently define as ethnicity. So take a bunch of families, and if those bunches of families all can trace back to some ancient patriarch, that is roughly what we would call your ethnicity today. Now, not a perfect fit. Language always changes. Some sociologists dump some other definitions into what we call ethnicity. But just based on my approximation of how we are using ethnicity today in our common on-the-street vernacular, your people... Your lau, this second category, is your ethnicity. Third, languages or glosses. This one is pretty obvious. This is a categorization of people by their native language. So us English speakers, we would all belong in this glosses bucket together. It's actually a super important category. And there's so much about a culture that is informed by the language itself. And it really breaks down the so-called differences between so-called black and white people that, nevertheless, may both speak English. They already have so much more in common with each other because of their common linguistic ground than, say, the black American has in common with the black Nigerian. Just being able to share the same idioms, the same slangs, this is all part of what makes a shared culture, a shared identity. Much more, I would argue, than your skin is a different color than mine, your face has different features than mine. So first, family, second, ethnicity, third, language, and then last, nation. In the Greek, ethnus is, again, pretty obvious and pretty much identical to our definition today. It speaks to a mixture of your citizenship, your geographical location, where your home is, and your political reality. So, American citizens, German citizens, Canadians, these are your national categorizations. So, once again, we have three identities, our group identity, our individual identity, and our spiritual identity. We are just talking about the first one today, our group identity. And this group identity can be subdivided into four categories according to Revelation 5.9, which is our family, our ethnicity, our language, and our nationality. Now, what do you notice about our biblical group identity? as opposed to the world's group identity of race. I think the clear difference is the former, unlike the latter, is verifiable and objective. 
Whereas your race is based on someone's totally arbitrary, stereotypical opinion of your appearance, your family, ethnicity, language, and nationality can be concretely demonstrated. It can be verified you belong to a certain family by your birth certificate a DNA test, or if you're adopted by your adoption papers or whatever, your ethnicity, which is again, just a scaled up version of your family can again, be verified by DNA or a record of your ancestry. Your language can be demonstrated. Your nationality is objective and verifiable. Just find a passport. Race cannot do any of these things. Race can provide no evidence. There is no white ancestor that you can trace back to that objectively makes you white. There's no Chad, son of Chuck from Kentucky that is the white people patriarch. And this is what people miss when some social justice false teachers like Sean White get into this huge fury about Jesus being depicted as white when he should be brown or black or whatever. You see, Sean White totally misses the point. Jesus had no race. Because race is a myth. The Bible doesn't recognize such a thing as a white or black or Hispanic or Asian person. There are ethnic Germans and Italians and French people, and they are not the same culturally, even if you find an example of all three with pale skin and blonde hair. Just look at how the European Union is barely hanging together. Just look at history and all the wars France and Germany had. They're all just a bunch of white people. Why are they killing each other, right? It's because, whereas we like to completely oversimplify in our modern American social conception as white people, there are clearly very important group distinctions between a pale-skinned French person and a pale-skinned German person. And in the case of Jesus, Jesus' group identity was Jewish. He was ethnically Jewish. And so this answers the question we raised earlier of what to do with Jewish people. Jewish is not a race. In other words, it's not defined by appearance. You are Jewish by verifiable objective evidence of your family line. This is why in Matthew's gospel, he opens with a painstaking documentation of Jesus' genealogy because Jesus, if he is the rightful king of the Jews, had to be demonstrably Jewish. Specifically, Jesus had to be demonstrably descended from one of the families of Israel. And there's a specific one. He had to come from Judah in order to fulfill uh, 2 Samuel 7. That, that's another point. So if you want to define Jesus's group identity more comprehensively, here it is. He belonged to the family of Judah, which can be drilled down to the family of David or even smaller, the family of Joseph and Mary. He was ethnically an Israelite, a Jew, he belonged to the group of Aramaic and Hebrew speakers, and he was nationally a citizen of Israel, which was in turn a vassal state of the Roman Empire. That was Jesus' group identity, at least in terms of uh, his humanity. And in the same way, that is how we ought to define our own group identity. Our families, our ethnicity, our mother tongue, our nationality, these are the true ways we define the diversities in the world today. You see, the all too common sentiment espoused by social justice advocates that, quote, white people as a monolithic group do this, or white people need to be cognizant of this, or white people need to stop doing this, is not only rude at best, vengeful at worst, it is wholly inaccurate. Racialism, which is wielded as a cruel weapon by the social justice advocate, completely flattens important distinctions between groups of people that belong to different families, ethnicities, languages, and nations. Now, here's the thing though. Think about it. If you belong to the same family or ethnicity as someone else, that typically means what? It typically means you are genetically related to one another, right? And if you're genetically related to one another, you will look approximately the same as that person, right? And therein lies the subtlety of the deception of racialism. This is why racialism seems true. 
This is why it seems like we can sort people by their appearance. People that look the same a lot of times tend to have cultural commonalities, but it's not actually because they look the same. It's because if you go back into their family history, you will find that they probably shared some common ethnic heritage. So it just so happens that the true biblical categories of human diversity, ethnicity, nationality, language, overlap a lot with the false racial categories. But racialism gets the story completely backwards. They start with the fact that these two people look the same, and therefore I expect them to act and think the same. There is something significant about a person's identity based on the fact that both of these guys' noses looks like this, or both of their hair is brown, their skin is dark, therefore they will be similar to each other. The racialist says there is something about who they are on the inside we can conclude simply starting from the outside, but that's totally reversed. That's completely the opposite of the truth. In stark contrast, the biblical worldview says the true significant similarities begin on the inside, who your parents are, what family you both belong to, and therefore how you were both raised, who your shared great-great-great-grandparents were, and what values and preferences and culture they instilled in your ethnic group, even generations later what nation you are a citizen of, the common values of your shared nationality, what common language you speak. And because of these way more important similarities, as a result, people belonging to the same family, ethnicity, language, and nationality often tend to just happen to look the same on the outside. But let me state it another way to hammer this point home. According to the Bible, similarity in appearance is an uninteresting side effect of shared family, ethnicity, language, and nationality. There is absolutely no information we gain about who a person is based on what they look like. There is nothing we can conclude or guess about a person's identity or life story based on their race alone. And does this not help explain why God hates when we judge based on appearances? It is a theme in scripture not to jump to conclusions about someone's character simply based on what you see on the outside. Israel got into huge trouble with this when they were appointing their king. They were judging purely based on appearance. They wanted a kingly looking man. They cared nothing about the character. They wanted someone tall, someone with a stately air about him, and they got Saul, a terrible king. But then, perhaps, as a good illustration of how even modern-day Christians can get mixed up, the godly prophet Samuel, who was tapped by God to replace Saul with God's chosen king, Samuel got, kind of got sucked into the same way of thinking. God sent Samuel to Jesse's family to appoint one of his sons as the true king of Israel, and what happens? Samuel sees the eldest, Eliab, who was apparently a very tall, good-looking fellow, and Samuel wrongly concludes, surely this is the guy, just look at him, I would follow this guy. And yet, what does God say? Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God does not judge by what people look like. This is why racialism is a lie. It's a ridiculous thing to do. Now, we have to humbly admit, we all tend to do that, myself included. But we need to be working to transform our thinking in this area, and it starts by acknowledging how absurd it is to define people based on what they look like. I mean, take eye color. Think about how absurd it would be if we went around saying, oh, people with green eyes always love spicy food, or people with gray eyes are so smart, people with brown eyes are always so lazy. I mean, these statements are not just potentially offensive. They're nonsensical. You sound crazy categorizing people and trying to conclude things about who they are by a physical feature, their eye color. But that's exactly what racialism is. How is racialism any different? 
Your skin color looks a certain shade of brown, therefore you're this or you're that. The absurdity of racialism becomes clear when you replace skin color with any other innocuous physical feature. Ugh, people with short thumbs are always so rude. Or, ah, oh, man, people with narrow shoulders are always so underprivileged. What? You're a crazy person. Now, I know what some of you guys are thinking. Some of you are immediately pushing back at me right now thinking, how can you deny the fact that I experience racism? How can you deny that I grew up as a minority being discriminated against because of my skin color or the way I looked? And to that, I would gently respond, please don't mishear what I just stated. I never said the phenomenon of racism isn't real. What I stated was the foundation of racism is the myth of racialism. Racialism isn't real. But regardless of that fact, most of the world thinks racialism is real. They think in a racialist way. And that is what makes racism a very real, very unfortunate reality of the fallen world we occupy today. For instance, I don't believe in fluffy unicorns. I know fluffy unicorns are a myth. Yet, if the whole world believed in fluffy unicorns, you can bet that my life will be affected by everyone's insane belief in fluffy unicorns. There will be laws about fluffy unicorns I need to abide by. My day-to-day -day interactions with people will be founded on a worldview of fluffy unicorns. There will be a fluffy unicorn awareness month or whatever. That is what I am trying to say. Racism is based on a mythology that, nevertheless, is very much alive and well and sadly won't be going away anytime soon. But that's where our distinctiveness as the church comes in. We'll get into this more in the next part, but consider this a bit of a preview. Now, an important consideration as we wrap up part one is that our group identity is not the end-all, be-all of who we are. Remember, it's just the first of three identities we possess. Our personhood is defined by more than just what group we belong to. We are also individuals, and beyond that, we have a more fundamental spiritual identity that rules above the other two identities. So we cannot be comprehensively defined by our, albeit legitimate, membership in certain groups of people. Being an ethnic Russian or Thai person is not everything about you. It's only a part of who you are. Being part of your particular family is not the full picture of who you are. And the same goes for your language and nationality. Even though these group diversities are important and do have a significant influence on who we are and how we think that we need to be cognizant of. So we just laid down some theory today about group identity. Next episode, we'll talk about our other two identities, our individual and spiritual identities. But then I eventually want to get into why all this matters and how this ought to affect our Christian walk, how the distortion of our identity has affected our theology, and what all of this has to say about sticky issues like racism and the like. So stay tuned for that. But for now, thanks for joining me today on Modern Dogma. Men Air, God is Sovereign.